Capcom's Trojan for the NES, a direct port of its original arcade counterpart released in 1986. For those wondering, no way this is fuck all to do with the condom brand whatsoever. Before this analysis goes underway, I'd like to take my usual opportunity and pass along my regards to the Boston Open Screen Committee, namely Phil Healy, Adam Van Voorhees, Adrian Atwood, and Bill Campbell, amongst many, Amanda Wilde from Somerville, Kerry Forbes from Quincy, the Bit Barn BitFest staff, Hall, Allen, Kasarjan, Clark, Kultoff, all the waiters, waitresses, chefs, what have you, Matt Lister and Rebecca Beechers Brooks from Dover, New Hampshire, Troll to the Band, composed of Schwaller, O'Grady, Fitzgerald, and DePaz, Shannon Larry, the better half of the aforementioned Schwaller, also from JP, Don Panzini from Revere, Matt Michael and Sarah Rostone from Frank, California, Sean Furst Sr. and Jr. from East Bridgewater, Tessa and Adam Amoroso, Mary Aurora Pearl, Kim Paquette, Kathy Bisbee, Aaron Kinney, Andrew Lowry from DIY and Shop, his better half Amanda Brack, Nick and Ashley DiStefano, Richard Kenneth Thomas Hawk and Lisa Vidal from Star Lab Studios, Lilia Valadina, alias Gumbert, Sam Mulligan, MC Facepalm, Glenn Ty, Megaran, Craig James R, Diamond Machine, Robot Sex Music, Borean Biff from Geek Beat Radio, Ben Muller in the Low Ceilings, Gabriel J. to Bencourt, alias Riley Sky 100 from Lowell and Fitchburg, The Off Seasons Ian Bergeson and Katie Kreisel from Nashua, New Hampshire, Christy Edmonds and Jamie Stone Dead, two local makeup effects artists, Snessy and Walk in Circles, DJ Clickbait, Isabella Jenks from West Virginia, Liz Totsky and Nia Shields, and Danny Shields, alias Scatterbox, Rob Attillo, Citizen Vic, alias Vicky Smalls, local actress, travel vlogger, and photographer Erica Derrickson, Alicia Jean Orsini Labita from Women in Film and Video New England, and finally, how could I possibly forget about Wiley and Jessamy? With those out of the way, here's the moment you've all been waiting for. The story set in a post apocalyptic medieval slash near future hybrid of a time period, following a nuclear war. Think of like Mad Max meets Highlander, Fist of the North Star by Boronson and Tetsuo Hara, or better yet, maybe, just maybe, another Capcom classic, Legendary Wings Anyone? Anyways, a lone hot-blooded gladiator, Ryu, no goddamn you, not that Ryu, rigorously trained in martial arts and armed with only a sword and shield, is hired to annihilate the ever-loving bejesus fuck out of Achilles the Dictator and his relentless gang of marauders. Lincoln Connor McLeod, meet your new goddamn comrade. Transcending our focus to the initial gameplay aspect, if you played the original arcade, it's pretty much the same spiel, being much more than just your run-of-the-mill side-scrolling hack and slash action romp, akin to Iram's Kung Fu, or Konami's Russian attack and the like. Your task was guiding your main swordsman through six desolate yet varied post-apocalyptic areas, from the ruined cityscape through vast mountainsides, and especially underground industrial and technical structures alike, leading up to the dictator's inner sanctum, all while keeping each and every hostile party at bay. Unlike the original arcade incarnation, however, this particular NES iteration sports hidden goodies within the sewers you fall into, where optional, if mandatory, boss confrontations also await, about which will be commentated on momentarily. With the control interface, by now I'm sure everyone's aware of what the D-pad does, right? In tandem with the customary horizontal migration and crouching via down, it also shifts the position of your shield while raising it. And here's the big kicker, in the true fashion of Dede's Karate Champ, and especially the earlier reference Kung Fu and Russian Attack, up is the only way to make your character jump, not A. In fact, B and A are used to hack and slash with your sword and raise your earlier recounted shield for defense respectively, and yet again the latter must be held down to alter its position in tandem with the D-pad, which I also previously addressed. Getting to the item rundown, the Super Jump Boots, obtained from the sewers commonly, in favor of the High Jump map from the original arcade, can be temporarily used for performing higher leaps, wing cards for instant life recovery, keys for opening certain passages in the latter half of the game, in favor of the open card from the arcade, S icons tighten your overall walking speed, P icons advance your overall attack performance, and bonuses in the form of extra points and or lives, all of which are necessary, if again voluntary, for progression. So if I were you, I'd consider myself screwed without them. Speaking of, the health meter is composed of 8 units, likewise with the bosses you confront, get hit that many times, and it's curtains for your ass. Enemy lineup-wise, your main marauder confronts an endless infinitude of gray smasher soldiers with spiked hammers, or maces if you will, red knife and bomb throwing slasher soldiers, whose projectiles can be blocked. Take note, your sword and shield will be instantaneously drifted away if the latter becomes open to an explosive impact, in which case A, they must be retrieved, or B, you're stuck with cockall but resorting to unarmed self-defense via your bare hands and well-dressed feet. Shit, Chuck Norris much? Mad bombers that throw dynamite out of windows, archers that fire their balls from within sewers, and especially atop mountains, skyro gyros or bombers on wing propellers, killer piranhas, red fire breathing barbarians that pop out of the water, and the like. Not to mention mini and main boss adversaries, including hunchback goblins that summon bats via shurikens, and fire breathing armadillo mutants, both of whom are total pussies, just like the common hostile parties, unless your dexterity and judgment aren't at their full potential, of course. And especially the Mamushi Hatchetmen, both singular and in pairs. Oversized Iron Arm Soldiers, aka whom I like to call a Bubbles Long Lost Bastard Twin after a line of crystal meth. Blue Armored Club Wielding Musclers, your quote unquote Trojan Doppelganger, who behaves and fights the same way your character does, barring the palette color swap, but a trifle more experience than resilience. King Shriek, two murderous flail wielding centurions, first appearing as statues and then resurrecting out of walls, the second of which comes to life following the annihilation of the first. And finally, Achilles himself. 
And as ever, I swear to Christ Almighty, they will mop the floor with their fucking skull, thus making you their bitch in the long run if your senses happen to shit the goddamn bed. However, should you manage to wipe your raining piss and fuckboy boss the hell out, it's onto the fallen territory, and by now, you pretty much get the gist of it all. Notwithstanding the decomposed and torturous control schematics, specifically the vertical and diagonal leaps, and the usage of your shield, it's nothing short of tolerable, intuitive, and far from degraded. Likewise with, who could've guessed, the repetitious yet unequivocal gameplay routine. While the challenge for Trojan isn't as extremely infuriating as another Capcom classic, I'm looking at you once again, Ghost of Goblins. Jesus H. Christ, practicing backstrokes and cannonballs with Ron Burgundy, Michael Phelps, and Mark Spitz on the River Sticks for hours on end isn't right up there. Notwithstanding the game's short extent, and how much of a spring breeze the first two to three areas are, the later ones will tempt you in more ways than one might grasp, to deteriorate your controller in zillions of diminutive fragments like a handful of left-behind stale croutons. In addition to the previously discussed adversary and boss confrontations, your assailant and defense tactics are of the utmost importance, not to mention the top-notch efficiency and timing that are associated with them. For instance, upon confronting the Armadillon, he'll roll around for a while, at which point you have to keep jumping to avoid damage, cause he had the usual defense logic, and then stand up, at which point you must strike before he starts breathing fire or rolling around yet again, shit of the latter, and wash, rinse, repeat. And the less I say about the Iron Arm, Muscler, and Doppelganger showdowns, the better. Your godlike FPS reflexes have to be dead the fuck on, in terms of landing as many blows as possible, if few, and either raising your shield or rearing back, or just flat out be a cheap bastard and wail on their asses via repeated mid-air slashes. Starting out with 3 lives, more of which, once again, you can rack up via the traditional high score system, or the hidden 1 ups, and a convenient post game over infinite continue trick, performed by holding up and pressing start at the title screen following your recent last life failure. Be sure to utilize them wisely, and take every previously recounted warning to heart, or you'll be swimming up Piss Creek minus a canoe and 2 paddles. As barren, condensed, and pabulum as the visuals appear to be, even for yet another early Capcom classic, they're nothing short of modest, thanks as a whole to the primitive yet augmented stage backgrounds and the edgy, oppressive nature they employ. Your main gladiator, armed or otherwise, and his vindictive regiment of opposers pretty much suffer the same fate, not only in terms of the lacking detail, but of their rather stiff and convoluted actions. They are, however, expressed just as they were in the original arcade iteration, if a smidgen or two by comparison. Of course, the only downside I'm more than inclined to throw out there is the occasional yet obstreperous mid-level flickering, even as you approach your intended target, but then again, why even bother bitching about anything at all? In terms of music and sound, conducted by Ayako Mori of Ghost and Goblins fame in collaboration with Harumi Fujita, based on her original arcade soundtrack, and when might I add that she also worked very closely with Tamayo Kawamoto on some occasions, the scores are pretty much in mixed bag territory as well. While some might end up looking the other way due to its unadulterated and repetitious nature, others will definitely find it to be rather remarkable and appropriate to the game's overall post-apocalyptic theme, yours truly included. In addition, while the sound effects are amusing, you know, your typical combat lore, for shits and gigs, be forewarned, they'll get on your nerves in no fucking time flat. In spite of it all, however, my top 5 personal favorites are as follows, stages 1, 2, and 3, the hidden sewer crevices, and the stage clear slash next area transition fanfare. Replayability-wise, considering this particular title hasn't been getting as much groundswell as the rest of its peers, and due to every other vital aspect I've summarized throughout, the only few values to take into account if you're willing to master, and who knows, eventually topple it, are as follows, judgment, alertness, and fortitude. But regardless of such, there's no way in hell you desire anything else in the universe other than to become well-versed in the fierce, indestructible ways of the Trojan. Henceforth, in rigorous dissolution, my final verdict on Trojan, although I don't cover much Capcom titles, nothing personal, but eventually that's about to change. And despite not having as much flair as the others, this is one that should be appreciated and mastered by many for generations and generations yet to come. Sure, the rudimentary gameplay hooks might seem like a pain in the cervix to get the uncanny knack of, but in no time whatsoever, it should be all smooth sailing, that's for sure, and it completely shits on the original arcade in every way possible, the latter of which, for the record, is available in numerous collections, including the Capcom Classics Collection Volume 1 on PS2 and Xbox by Digital Eclipse and, of course, Capcom themselves, and the Capcom Arcade Cabinet on PS3, or if you want to emulate it on MAME or Final Burn, hey, go nuts! But seriously, I'd get my ass out there and give this overlooked adventure a jolt or two, and I assure you, there's no way in hell you'd be disenchanted in the least. Until then, this is the Hardcore Retro God proudly signing off.